My name's David Roberts. I'm a neurosurgeon at Dartmouth. Uh, I've been there for uh, my entire career, and I've worked very, very closely with the, uh, I'm on the faculty at the medical school at Dartmouth, and I work very closely and always have with the engineering school and my colleagues that, there. Um, our biomedical engineering program at Dartmouth is, is extremely well integrated between schools, and uh, some of my closest colleagues are, are in the biomedical engineering program. Image guidance, back when, when we first were working on this, in the, uh, back in the late 70s, early 80s, if you presented a paper on so-called frameless stereotaxy or image guide or neuro, neuro navigation, you got a lot of blank looks and questions and uh, people upset that this was crazy. And uh, it's kind of nice to have seen over the course of three decades that now integrated into pretty much every operating room uh, in the world. So image guidance is is very much established as a technology. There are a couple of ways that, that it's implemented. One, one would simply be if you took a pointer that was being tracked in space, touching a part of the surgical field, perhaps tissue, you wonder is this the boundary of a tumor, and being able to look on a monitor next to the field that would show you the corresponding, the appropriate slice on an MRI, and with a little cursor showing you where you are, and as you move, that cursor would move. Uh, many of the early systems, that's how they worked. In fact, they all have that capability. As a surgeon, uh, you can make the workflow more efficient if you provide that information in a heads-up display. When we use an operating microscope, we're looking at the surgical field, and we can superpose on the surgical field an outline of a tumor that's derived from the information in that MRI scan. And the surgeon has that information Right, right in front of uh, him or her. Our, our first research uh, uh, activities were in stereotaxy and integrating an operating microscope into the operating room and trying to eliminate the stereotactic frame that is a device attached to the patient's head that doesn't lend itself very well to open craniotomies. And for uh, in fact, continuing to today, that image guidance uh, development has been a major, major activity at Dartmouth across multiple departments and schools. And personally, my interest in, in imaging uh, comes out of that because all of the imaging that has really been the engine behind so much in clinical neuroscience to integrate it into interventions like surgery, requires a co-registration step, requires importing that data into the operating room environment while you work. That's what image guidance was all about, and that's what our current interests in, in fluorescent technologies are about. Fluorescence technologies actually have been recognized and used in surgery for more than 60 years, but uh, they got a big boost about 10, 15 years ago uh, with the particular fluorophore of ALA-induced protoporphyrin-9. It got a lot of visibility from some clinical trials, and now that has driven an interest in optical, uh, improving the optical tissue uh, identification recognition during surgery. Uh, and I think it's the tip of the iceberg. I think what's being done today with protoporphyrin-9 a little bit with fluorescein, uh, is, is pioneering stuff that in relatively few years there will be much smarter fluorophores that are targeted to specific cells, particular uh, types of tumor, uh, things that help us differentiate tumor from functional tissue, normal tissue that we want to preserve at surgery. So the fluorescent technologies are exploding. And <clears throat> the, these, these technologies are, are interrelated very closely. The co-registration problem of image guidance, we got into the, the optics directly out of that, out of that uh, project because the problem with co-registration is that you're preoperatively, ta you're taking a preoperative image and you're co-registering it at the start of the case and during surgery that, <clears throat> that surgical field deforms, it gets resected so that your registration is constantly becoming less accurate. And uh, fluorescent technologies rely on the intrinsic properties of the tissue itself. And if the tissue moves, those biomarkers are moving with the tissue. 
fluorescent tissue if it if it moves <clears throat> that that guidance remains very very accurate so it's it's complementary to image guidance if you take surgery even even when I started training uh, it was kind of like the like a barnstorming pilot in an open cockpit flame and it was kind of a romantic notion and you'd be flying over the countryside and you'll say yes that's the temporal lobe and <clears throat> and a lot of a, a lot was accomplished with that technology. Today, uh, all of us came to this meeting with a uh, computer-driven uh, plane that was knew where it was uh, incredibly precisely and far more safely than 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 the pilots of of yore used to. And surgery today is very much flying by instruments. There are many things that. Uh, we rely on an on a accuracy of where we are and a definition of boundaries that uh, exceeds what somebody's sort of sense of where they are is. The, you still require that, but um, you could not do many of these surgeries today without these technologies. Tumors lended themselves first to this because A, they, they uh, were being identified on CT scans and MRI scans and you had to know where they were, you had to find them. Uh, it's a very structural problem and they're embedded typically in the tissues so that idea of locating them and knowing their boundaries was useful and most people just say tumor, tumor, tumor. That's certainly true for image guidance, it's true for fluorescence technologies. But the reality is that these technologies are directly applicable to many other areas of surgery. Increasingly, epilepsy surgery will be done with it. A lot of functional mapping, that is normal brain wanting to know where speech is or where hand motor function is, we, we need to know that because we don't want to injure those areas. And many of these technologies are very, very useful for guiding the surgeon to know where those tissues are and preserving those. Um, vascular neurosurgery historically has been uh, slower to, to adopt many of the image guidance techniques for, for several reasons. One, it's not so much buried inside the brain as on the outside. So, um, you could operate by your eye and landmarks more. But the neuroimaging today available for vascular applications uh, actually makes it possible to do safer, better surgery if you can integrate those technologies. So we're gonna, going to see that. I think this is going to spill out into to all areas of not just neurosurgery, but there are many other disciplines um, that are going to be incorporating image guidance into their, their operating rooms.